job analysis and talent management process. In this chapter, we will describe and define talent management and explain why it is important. Furthermore, we will explain also about job analysis and include on why it's important. And moreover, there will be job descriptions, job specifications, and later on competency-based job analysis. And to begin with, my name is Elzan, and here are my fellow teammates for this project, uh, for this presentation. Um, Zaki, Alia, Salman, Zaki, Kiki, and Yana. So the first topic that we will talk about is the talent management process. So there are eight steps of talent management process. The first one is decide what position to fill through job analysis, personal planning, and forecasting. And then the second one is build a pool of job applicants by recruiting internal or external candidates. And then next, obtain application forms and perhaps have initial screening and reviews. Uh, the fourth one is the selection tools like tests, interviews, background checks, and physical exams to, to identify viable candidates. And then we decide to whom to make an offer. Then we orient, train, and develop employees so they have the competencies to do their jobs. Next, we appraise employees to assess how they're doing and less compensate employees to maintain their motivation. There can be problems or differences from the theory when we apply those steps in real life. The first one is the process usually isn't really stepwise. For example, sometimes the manager appraises the employee's performance first before training them so that they can decide the right way to train them and develop their competencies. The second problem is sometimes when we're too focused to do each of the steps, we often forget about the result that we want to achieve from the whole whole process. Moving on to the definition of talent management, talent management is the holistic, integrated, and results and goal-oriented process of planning, recruiting, selecting, developing, managing, and compensating employees. So what should the talent managers do in practice? So the first action that um, they, they will start with the result and ask what what recruiting, testing, training, or pay action should I take to produce the employee's competency, to, to produce the employee competencies we need to achieve our company's goals? And then the second activities is um, treat activities such as recruiting and training as interrelated um, because they know that having the right employees are really depends on those two, two activities. And then um, uh, they will probably use the same profile of required human skills, knowledge, and behavior for formulating a jobs requirement plans. And last, they take steps to actively coordinate and integrate talent management functions such as recruiting and training. For example, HR managers uh, need to make sure they are using the same skills profile to recruit uh, the employees. Okay, so moving on, we're going to discuss about uh, job analysis. What is actually job analysis? Job analysis is the procedure of determining the duties and skills of a job and the kind of person who fit or who should be hired to do it. This contains about job description and job classification, which will be discussed with my friend later. So I am going to tell about what is uh, actually, what can we obtain from performing the job analysis. The first thing we can uh, obtain information like work activities, performance standards, human behaviors, job context, machine tools, equipment, uh, for the job and also the human requirements. So we can uh, get a more in-depth information about jobs can, uh, which contains the previous items I mentioned. So uh, after obtaining the information, what can we do with it? 
uh, we can use it into uh, to, we can make it a very useful information for our recruitment process, eco compliance, performance appraisal, training, and compensation. May I give some example? For example, in compensation, if we do a job analysis, we know what are the requirements for a job. We know what are how the job is actually weigh, and uh, how heavy is the job is. So we can compensate accordingly with what uh, people have put effort into the job with what skills they have put there, what kind of knowledge that they have put there. That's one of the usage. Another thing like on recruitment, when you hire people, you want to hire the right people to do that job. So by knowing the job description, by knowing the job specifications, you can hire a more accurate people. Or, or, I mean a more accurate person. By having job analysis, we can also do what is it called as the business process re-engineering. Business process engineering usually is done by combining steps that you usually uh, formerly done by a sequence of departments, but by this re-engineering, we can use small multifunction process teams to do that job using uh, information technology. And here are the steps. Identify the business process first, which one we are going to re-engineer. Then we measure the performance. Then we identify the opportunities. Then we redesign the and and then we implement it and we assign our ownership. Okay. So uh, moving on, do you think actually specialized jobs are efficient? Well, yes, according to early economists. But for now. We don't know because uh, people are changing, people are, people are evolving. So for now, it's not really that efficient. That's why we need, what is it called, by the job enlargement. Job enlargement means that we uh, assign more jobs in the same level. Speaking of job enlargement, actually job enlargement have two components. The first one is the job rotation which means we systematically move workers from one job into another. We can take an example in a factory with ha which have production line. When we move a worker from one station to another station, they get a new thing to do. So we can prevent them getting bored of the sequence they often do on a daily basis and they get a new job to do. So that is what is it called the job rotation. Just um, exactly like what rotation means, right? And then the next one, or the second one, we have job enrichment. Job enrichment means that we redesign the jobs so that they can increase the opportunity for the workers to feel or to have a new responsibility or have achievement, growth, and recognition. These uh, are very this very are very important understanding the job analysis so we can increase the workers or the job satisfaction also next my friend salman will explain about how we can obtain the information to do the job analysis please salman um okay i'd like to explain more about how can companies how can recruiters uh, collect uh, job analysis informations. Um, basically, there are various ways to collect information on a job's duties, responsibilities, and activities. And it usually includes these four uh, methods, including interviews, uh, questionnaires, uh, observations, and diaries or logs. Um, because these really do gather realistic information about what the job incumbents do and managers use these methods for developing job descriptions as next uh, interview is a conversation between a job applicant and a representative of an employer which is conducted to assess whether the applicant should be hired or not. Um, job analysis interviews range from completely unstructured interviews 
to highly structured ones containing hundreds of, of specific items to check off. Uh, several companies also have their own personalized type of interview. For example, uh, consulting companies, they like to use a uh, case interview, a lot of market sizing, a lot of problem solving and critical thinking approach. And then uh, managers may also conduct individual interviews with each employee, group interviews with group employees and or supervised with a supervisor who knows more about the job. From an interview, the information sources will be around, uh, around from the people uh, who are interviewing as uh, the supervisors. And the advantages is that it's quick, it's direct, and it's, it's, an, it's a, an easy way to find overlooked information. Meanwhile, uh, the disadvantages is the expand expense and time consumed in one preparing the questionnaire and also conducting if there is a lot of candidates there can also be biases uh, in in these kind of interviews next uh, to conduct an interview the job analyst and supervisor will work together uh, to identify the workers who know the job best and therefore they will quickly establish a rapid with the interviewee, followed with a structured guide or checklist uh, uh, that can be open-ended question or specific question, and it provides space for answers. And by the end of the interview, they will review and verify the data, and therefore will conclude whether the interviewee will be hired or not. Um, next. The second common method is a questionnaire, which is a set of printed or written questions with a choice of answers devised for the purposes of job analysis. Uh, the information sources will be that uh, the employees will have to fill out these questionnaires and describe their job related duties and responsibilities. And the formats can be structured checklists or open ended questions. It, it depends on, on what the company is looking for. Uh, the advantages of using questionnaire as the method of collecting information in job analysis is that it's quick, it's an efficient way to gather information from large numbers of employees. But of course, it comes with a price, is that, which is the expense and the time consumed in, in preparing and testing the questionnaire. Um, as and with the interviews, uh, employees will also may distort their answers uh, con con consciously or unconsciously. Next. The third method is observation. Uh, it's a set of, uh, it's when it's useful, especially when jobs consist of mainly uh, observable physical activities. Observation is usually not appropriate when the job entails a lot of mental activity or if the employee only occasionally engage in important activities. Um, the information source from an observation will be observing, obviously, and noting the physical activities and they go about their jobs by, by their managers. Thus, these people map the a KPI or key performance indicators, does they map the target and, and whatsoever. Uh, the advantages is that it, it provides a first hand information, it, it's valid, it's real, the data, and it reduces the, the distortion of, of information. But of course, it is very time consuming. It is uh, the reactivity tends to respond uh, distortly, uh, especially in representing uh, employee behavior as well as it's difficult in capturing the entire job cycle and it's it's a very little little use if job involves a high level of mental activity next um the the fourth method is participant logs or diary uh, which is uh, a daily record of news and events of a personal nature um, workers are asked to keep a record of what they do during the day by, by writing a, 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 
a diary or a log. This can produce or can picture a very complete a, a very complete picture of the job, especially when supplemented with subsequent interviews with the worker and the supervisors. And the employee, of course, uh, wait, I'll, I'll start the, with the advantages first. Uh, it will produce a more a complete picture of the job and uh, more employee participation. But of course, uh, it, it tend to distort information and it depends on the employee's uh, accuracy in recalling their activities. And of course, the employees might try to exaggerate some of the activities and underplay the others. Uh, but but I think there is there has been a massive massive transformation where diaries and logs have gone high tech. Some companies and firms give their employees pocket dictating machines and pagers. Then and at random times during the day they would page the workers to ask what what they're doing at at what time. And this approach can avoid uh, the pitfall of the diary or the log method that is done traditionally, <laughs> which is remembering what they did hours earlier. Probably go to the next slide. Um, other than the four methods I've explained before, there are three other methods. It is it is popular, but it's not not necessarily uh, as as efficient as the one before, which is a quantitative job analysis, uh, internet, uh, internet based job analysis and multiple source of data collection. Uh, and quantitative is usually because qualitative methods aren't always suitable. And it is possible to assign quantitative values to, to certain jobs. Uh, then internet based job analysis uh, overcomes the the shortfalls of the conventional methods and enables instant simultaneous international distribution. And for the multiple sources of data collection, uh, it, it's, it's, it overcomes un unreliability from data that are not valid. And diverse source could include groups, individuals, and observers. Um, I think uh, throughout all these methods, there is no perfect one. There is no that one one size fits all. Um, and I think what's the best and what most companies has been doing today is to mix a lot of them. So they would start with online tests, or probably start with uh, CV and, and letter screening, and then continue with online tests, and then continue with first interview, probably continue with a focus group discussion, maybe another interview, so on and so forth. Um, I think that concludes my uh, explanation and my colleague will continue. So next, we'll be talking about writing job description. Job description is a written statement of what the worker actually does, how to do it, and what the job's working conditions are. So most description contains sections that covers first, job identification, it contains several types of information, such as job titles and the date that the job desk was actually approved. The second one is job summary, which to summarize the essence of the job, include only its major function or activities. The third one is relationship statement. It shows the job holder's relationship with others inside and outside the organization. The fourth one is responsibilities and duties. It's the heart of the job description. It represents a list of job significant responsibilities and duties. Referring to the job analysis, this section should reveal what the employees in each job are doing. The next one is standard of performance. This section lists the standard that the company expects the employees to achieve for each of the job desk main duties and responsibilities. And the last one is working condition. Next. Job specifications. So there is a main question for job specification, which is what human traits and experience are required to do the job effectively? So uh, it differs into three types. The first one is specification for trained versus untrained personnel. With the trained personnel, the writing will be more straightforward. The job specification tends to focus on factors such as length of previous service, 
quality of relevant training and previous job performance. With the untrained personnel, with the intention to train them, when filling jobs for untrained people, you must specify qualities such as physical traits, personal, personality, interest, or sensory skill that implies some potential for performing the job or for trainability. The second is specification based on judgment. Most job specifications simply reflect the educated guesses of most people like supervisor and human resource managers. The third one is job specification based on stat statistical analysis. So this is a more defensible approach than the judgment approach before, but it's also more difficult because it have a procedure that consists of five steps. The first one is to analyze the job and decide how to measure the job performance. The second one is select personal traits like finger dexterity that you believe should predict performance. The third one is test candidates for the traits. The fourth one is measure this candidate's subsequent job performance and the Last one is statistically analyze the relationship between the human trait and job performance. So um, despite there are several types of job specification in practice, most employers rely on judgmental approaches. Uh, the last one is the job requirement matrix. So it is a more complete description of what the worker does and how or why he or she does it. It clarifies each task proposes and each duty required knowledge, skill, abilities, and other characteristics. The main objective in creating a job requirement matrix involves writing the task statement that describes what the worker does on each of the main job duties, separate job tasks, and how the worker does it. Next. So uh, this is a typical job requirement matrix that consists of five columns. The com Column number one consists of each of the jobs four or five main job duties, such as uh, this is example, post account payable. Uh, the second column talks about the task statements for the main task associated with each main job duty. The column number third talks about the relative importance of each main job duty. Column number fourth, talk about the time spent on each main job duty. And the last column talks about the knowledge skills, ability, and other human characteristic related to each main job duty. Next. Okay, so now I'm going to explain about employee engagement guide for managers. First of all, employee engagement is defined as employees emotional investment in their work in terms of the passion they put into their work and the motivation they feel to do their job well. Simon Sinek, the author of Start With Why, describes employee engagement in the simplest of terms, quote, when people are financially invested, they want to return. When people are emotionally invested, they want to contribute. Meaning, engaged employees are an invaluable asset in today's, in today's competitive workforce. You understand that engaged employees are committed, passionate, inspired, and they inspire others with their example. Next slide, please, thank you. So why is employee engagement important for business? A Gallup study states that the behaviors of highly engaged business units result in 21% greater profitability. Also, employees appreciate work culture that enables engagement. This means that organizations that prioritize engagement are more likely to attract and retain more talent. Who is responsible for employee engagement? The responsibility of planning engagement activities and executing them is not on HR alone anymore. But yes, HR plays an active role in implementing employee engagement strategies, but the planning and execution require involvement from leaders and managers in the organization as well. The success of an employee engagement program depends on employees' willingness to do it. Next slide, please. So there are eight primary, primary elements of employee engagement that an organization needs to support in order to have a, full, a truly engaged team. So the first one is leadership. For example, employees are desperate to have meaningful relationships with their managers 
one of the greatest predictors of employee commitment is their re relationship with their managers. We can overstate this, that when it comes to engagement, good management is very critical. The second one is communication. Good communication is what makes a good manager. Make sure manager communicate with your employees openly, honestly, and often. Don't shield the employees from news of like business failures because hearing it from the manager itself will endanger trust. The third one is culture. A positive, a positive corporate culture result in happy employees who want to come to work every morning. Not only that, but the better the culture, the more profitable the company. The fourth one is reward and recognition. Many employees say they would work hard, harder if they were recognized more. The, uh, this includes formal recognition, for example, like employees of the month programs, as well as informal programs such as thank you cards, because what gets recognized gets repeated. Next slide, please. Thank you. The fifth one is professional and personal growth. Keep your employees engaged by giving them appropriate opportunities for growth in the right direction. And the sixth one is accountability and performance. Everyone wants to be part of a winning team. People who perform well feel good about themselves, but like any other team, they need coaches who can provide honest feedbacks. The seventh one is vision and values. Um, so engage in employees understand the big picture and how they fit into it. If employees feel like a part of something bigger than themselves, they are much more likely to go above and beyond to, to contribute to that greater purpose. And then the last one, the eighth one is corporate social responsibility or CSR. Um, employee engagement level are twice as high among employees who say they are proud of the contributions their organization has made to the community. But, but successful companies tend to be deeply connected with their communities, committed to social outreach, and they encourage their employees to participate in worthy causes that make the world a better place. Next slide, please. So uh, here are one of the one of the examples of employee engagement in action. So the first one is L'Oreal. In 2017, L'Oreal built an employee onboarding app that is only devoted to helping new recruits understand and embrace their company culture by delivering key information. L'Oreal has made it clear that engagement begins at the start of the employee life cycle. The second example is about the human resource consulting company called Development Dimensions International. This company conducted a study of 3,800 employees and it identified several personal characteristics that seem to predict the likelihood of someone would be engaged. And these traits included adaptability, passion for work, emotional maturity, positive disposition, self-advocacy, uh, self and achievement orientation. Next slide, please. Lastly, what is the future of employee engagement? So now the best practices for employee engagement have truly evolved and organizations have realized that employee engagement is something they can encourage and control. And companies are beginning to move beyond employee engagement to focus on workforce ex experience, following a technology-enabled, data-driven approach to implement and measure employee engagement. And this can elevate the level of happiness, satisfaction, and, and involvement employees experience on the job. And as the famous saying goes, happy employees make happy happy customers. Next slide, please. All right, to begin the next topic, um, I'd like to discuss about competency models. So why should we use competency models? In HR, it's very essential that there is one key element to note, wherein jobs, jobs are everlastingly ever-changing. 
What it means is that many people still think of a job as a set of specific duties someone carries for out for a pay. But as mentioned before, jobs is constantly changing. Next, please. So firstly, companies today, they tend to flatten out uh, hierarchies and they tend to um, act with squeezing out managers. And of course, um, there's also ever-changing priorities leaving workers to adapt. And as a result, there needs to be something that changes as well. Next. So what happens is, as a result, methods which itemize specific work duties, which employees must do, is often impractical. They no longer have a set specific things of what the employees must do. Rather, employees use a newer job analysis effort, where instead of listing job duties, they list competency models, which include knowledge, skills, and experience needed by the company, for example. Next. So for example, it's um, as the diagram shows um, on this slide, where a competency is essentially a cluster of highly interrelated attributes, such as research, design, knowledge, critical thinking skills, and deductive reasoning skills. Where in here, from what the picture shows, I'm not sure if it's quite clearly seen, but the purple one explains about behavioral competencies, while the green one talks about technical competency. And in here, the purple one includes things like leadership, navigation, business acumen, um, ethical practice, consultation, and communication, while the green one focuses on the technical aspect, which focuses on people, organization, workplace, and strategy. Uh, next. So, all, well, what it means is all in all, the competency model then becomes um, a sort of like a guidepost for recruiting, selecting, training, evaluating, and developing employees for each job. Where in this case, for instance, the manager hires new employees using tests that measure the profile's list of competencies. When afterwards, they also train employees with courses that develop these competencies. And lastly, they also appraise performance by assessing the workers' competencies. Next. So next, what comes into mind is how do you write competency statements? The competency statement will include three elements, where in there is the name and a brief description of the competency, example being the project management, where the description is creating accurate and effective project schedules. And the second is the description of the observable behaviors that represent proficiency in the competency. The example would be to continuously manage project risk and dependencies by making timely decisions. Next. And the third and the last is the proficiency levels where, um, for example, for project, project management from low to high, the example would be, well, where there's the uh, level one, two, three, where the first one could be said where they, for example, it identifies project risk and dependencies and communicates routinely to stakeholders. And the second one, it stages on to develop systems to monitor risk and dependencies and report changes. And on the level, on the last level, it anticipates changing conditions and impacts the risk and dependencies and takes preventive action. And next, uh, we have the skill matrix where in here, the skills matrix, um, on, on this example, this is a skill matrix for uh, technical or engineering product development employees where the light blue represents the level required for each skill for these product development employees. Um, another key aspect to note would be the levels, for example, the level one and uh, onto level six. The level one could mean, for example, it's for technical expertise uh, in terms of the category might say it has or is in process of acquiring the basic knowledge necessary to do this type of job, for example. While in the level six might say they're capable of conducting and supervising highly complex analytical tasks requiring advanced technical know-how and skills. What this means is these core competencies, um, these competency-based analysis has a new and more modern way of looking into jobs where they no longer less duties because companies and work always 
changes where it's ever lastingly changing. And as a result, they must also develop, the HR division must also develop into finding new ways on how to improve the division much better. And um, that is all for, <laughs> that is all for our presentation. Thank you very much.